In 1942, with the beginnings of the tempest and refinements of the typhoon still underway, Sidney, ever forward-thinking, had begun to give thought to a slimmed-down, lighter version of his new interceptor. The process of achieving this goal would be through the use of more modern technologies and construction techniques now available thanks to the advent of several material science breakthroughs and several new understandings in aerodynamics. The wing was the first point of focus, as while the thinner laminar flow design of the Tempest was great, Sydney would opt to use a semi-elliptical wing with an overall shorter wingspan on his as-of-yet unnamed design, to save weight while still retaining similar performance. Other changes included the usage of a fully monocoque structure, in which the weight and load of the aircraft is transmitted and supported by the aircraft's metal skin, rather than heavy internal bracing and supports. The last change of significant note was the cockpit which, while retaining the same layout and design as the Tempest, was placed higher to allow for increased visibility. To power this new beast, there was once again a debate on engines. Again, the contenders being Rolls-Royce with their Griffin, Bristol with two versions of their Centaurus, and Napier with their Sabre IV. Each design had advantages and disadvantages, and so each one would have a prototype built to fly with to see which one was the best. The first prototype would be the Bristol Centaurus in late 1944, with the second prototype flying with a Griffin a month after. Only the last prototype, prototype LA-610, was fitted with a Napier Sabre 7, but would achieve the most amount of power with upwards of 4,000 horsepower, and highest top speed, attaining an indicated airspeed of 485 miles per hour in level flight. However, despite the Sabre's performance, the Bristol Centaurus would be selected, for much of the same reason as why the earlier Tempest Mark II was built. The Napier Sabre was simply too prone to mechanical failure, and despite several years in development, the Sabre still had a number of teething issues it was still trying to get through. Officially built with the Bristol Centaurus Mark 18, the newly christened Hawker Fury would be put into final design prep, in lieu of pre-production. Hawker would be approached by the Royal Navy around this time, who expressed interest in having a new naval interceptor similar in performance to the Tempest. Sydney, seeing an opportunity, would show that he could easily convert the new Hawker Fury to fit the requirements. And so, the Hawker Sea Fury was born. Just in time for the war to end. The RAF, who had originally been expressing interest in the design, would opt out of purchasing any examples before production began, citing that their Spitfires and Tempests were perfectly adequate, and the Fury did not offer any significant difference in comparison to the two. The Royal Navy, however, was still very interested in the Sea Fury, as they were still equipped with Sea Fires, Navalized Spitfires, and lend fought Corsairs from America. The Sea Fire was not a particularly good naval aircraft, and the Corsairs, with the war's end, were all to be either returned to the U.S. or purchased at considerable cost to a war-drained Britain. With the first production model of the Sea Fury flying in late 1946, Hawker would then begin a sales drive for possible export customers. Aside from the Royal Navy, the Royal Australian, Canadian, and Netherlands Navy would also field the Sea Fury, as well as West Germany, Iraq, Egypt, Burma, Pakistan, and even Cuba. With a wide range of customers, the final production tally of the Sea Fury would end up being 864 aircraft, enjoying a 10-year production run. Now, less than a thousand aircraft may seem like a low number, but this is the post-war era, where the need of combat aircraft was not as high as it was during wartime, especially with new jets coming into the foray such as the North American F-86 Sabre, which was introduced to service in 1949, just as a comparison. Speaking of the Sabre, the Hawker Sea Fury would not go its life without seeing combat as many post-war piston-powered aircraft would. It would find itself pushed to service with the outbreak of the Korean War in 1950, being sent off to operate as a ground attack platform and interceptor from the Royal Navy carriers Glory, Theseus, and Ocean, as well as the Australian carrier Sydney. During the early portion of the war, aerial resistance against UN forces was minimal, with the biggest threat being anti-aircraft fire and mechanical failure. But in 1952, this would change as the MiG-15 entered the theater. During an escort mission flying alongside ferry fireflies to their target, eight MiG-15s ambushed the flight from on high. The Sea Furies responded, and in the ensuing scuffle, one managed to shoot down one of the jets in a very rare case of a prop winning against a jet in a dogfight. Outside of this moment, most of the Sea Furies' life in Korea would be as a ground attack fighter supporting UN forces. Outside of Korea, however, export customers would use the Sea Fury in a few minor wars and events, with Cuban Sea Furies fighting against Brigade 2506 in the Bay of Pigs invasion, and Iraqi Sea Furies operating limitedly during the 1948 Arab-Israeli War, and much more so in the Kurdish uprisings in the 60s.
With jets becoming more commonplace, however, Sea Furies would ultimately be retired in 1968 by the Burmese Air Force, bringing their service to an end in the military world. But, like many notable piston-engined aircraft, the Sea Fury would get a second lease on life in the civilian sector, in the scene of air racing. Here, Sea Furies would show up in a large number, and be associated with many of the big names during the Reno air races, such as Sawbones, Dreadnought, Furious, September Fury, and many, many more, which would all fly in competition with several winning championships. Today, many Sea Furies exist, with several flying around still in the cases of the Race Furies. For those on display, you can find them in nations around the world, such as the Netherlands, Cuba, and even a former Race Fury in the USA. Though built after the war, the Sea Fury held true to its legacy as a very good plane, and adds to Cindy Cam's legacy as one of the best aircraft designers the world has ever seen. From Typhoon to Tempest to Sea Fury, the Big Beast flew in form after form for well over 20 years in combat, and lives on in the civilian world to this day, with seemingly no plans to sit down permanently anytime soon.